In this screencast, we introduce the path trace feature of SUSIQ. Path trace in SUSIQ is akin to Traceroute, which is one of the oldest and most valuable tools in a network operator's toolkit. Path in SUSIQ enhances this functionality by providing additional information that can help you troubleshoot what the problem might be right inside SUSIQ without having to log into multiple boxes. Traceroute, the original Traceroute that is, sends packets, real packets through the network to trace the path of a packet through the network. Unlike Traceroute, SUSIQ simulates packet forwarding behavior to trace the path of the packet. This simulation uses state of the forwarding tables that the SUSIQ Polar has gathered. The path trace works across routed and overlay networks. In overlay networks, it presents a unified view of the overlay and the underlay paths. It also works on some pure L2 hops. As SUSIQ supports multi-vendor networks, path also works across most of the popular network operating systems in the marketplace today, including Cisco's NXOS, Cumulus Linux, Arista's EOS, Junos, and Sonic. Support for other popular network operating systems such as iOS XR is in the works. For the screencast, we'll be using this topology, which is a classical enterprise data center topology. The topology shows dual attached servers with the leaves that they are connected to using some form of MLAG or equivalent technology. The connectivity between the leaves and the spines is via IP routing. We also have exit leaves and a firewall that separates the internal fabric from the data center edge router. So if you switch to the SUSIQ GUI and click on path, you're presented with this screen where the inputs that you need to provide are on the left-hand side of the screen in the sidebar. We have multiple topologies to demonstrate various uh, uh, aspects of path. We will start with this one, which is a simple L3 topology built using uh, BGP. Just like in trace, you enter the source and dest IP addresses and you hit trace and SUSIQ then produces this output that you see on the screen. There are multiple different pieces of information that is important to pay attention to in this output that SUSIQ produces. The first is the SUSIQ is the summary of path trace. This summary consists of critical pieces of information that will help you make sense of a larger network quite quickly. Then there is the graphical view of the path trace itself. Third, there are a set of tables that are provided inside the output itself, in the output itself, that help you be able to take quickly look at an anomalous output where the output is not what you expect it to be to see if there are any failures in critical resources that's causing this problem or this anomalous output to appear. And finally, SUSIQ trace output inside the GUI also produces path in tabular format, that is this part, which shows you the same output that was graphically shown and summarized, but in detail as a tabular format. If this is something that is far more easier for you to grok, that information is present here as well. However, all of the information that you see in the tabular output is present in the graphical output as well, as we will see in the next few minutes. So let's examine each of these critical outputs one by one. Let's start with the summary first. The summary that we see here traces some, provides some really critical pieces of information about the path. The first thing it tells you is how many paths exist between the source and the destination. In this case, there are eight paths that are present. At every hop in the path, and there are four hops here as indicated, it tells you how many ECMP paths are possible to be utilized. For example, between server and leaf, there are two paths. Between the leaf, three, four, and spine, there are two paths. Between the spines and the egress leaf, there are two paths. And finally, from the egress leaf to the destination, there is one path, and that is the information that is shown over here. The next critical piece of information it shows is the path MTU. This is the maximum size packet that you can send from the source and expect it to reach the destination without fragmentation or the packet being dropped. There is an MTU mismatch uh, information as well, which tells you if there is any MTU mismatch between the different links, 
that are being that are followed from the source to the destination. It also tells you if there is an overlay that is being used. In this case, it says false because we are not using an overlay. The black lines that are present in the graphical output indicate that it is an L3 hop or a routed hop. Switching to the graphical output now, you see that the arrows are all pointing in a specific direction because trace, just like trace route, Suzy Q's path trace traces the path in the direction from the source to the destination. However, at each hop, just as trace route provides ICMP uh, return packets to be able to make sure that the reverse path exists, Suzy Q's trace path trace also does a check in the forwarding state of every hop. For example, on leaf four, it checks that it can go back to server 104. On Spino 2, it checks it can go back to server 104 and so on to ensure that a reverse path exists as well. And if the reverse path does not exist, then it flags that error and notifies you about it. So while the packet trace, just like in trace route, while the packet is path is traced from the source to the destination, the reverse path is checked as well. The arrows help you figure out the actual direction of the packet flow. In this particular topology, it's actually quite simple and you can follow the packet flow without the arrows. But in certain other topologies where the packet flows across VRFs or in the case of service chaining, these arrows help you follow the path much more easily. The numbers that are against each of the hops is the hop number associated with it. So the first hop is from server 104 to leaf 04, the second hop is from leaf 04 to spine 02, and so on. Besides the information that is shown over here, the other thing you can get is you can hover over any one of these pieces of uh, in, uh, any one of the graphical outputs, for example, on a node to get additional information. In this particular case, when you hover over a node, you get information if any critical resource has failed, and if it has, what is the count of that uh, failed resource? How many of them have failed, for example? So for example, if leaf03 did not exist in this output and you were expecting leaf03 to be present, if leaf03 had died, the device count would be one here to indicate that maybe there's a failed device. If instead the link between server 104 and leaf03 was down, the interfaces count might be one to indicate that the link was down. In all of these cases, you can look at the information that's provided over here to figure out if the output is actually, the var count over there is actually applicable to the problem. And this output is specific. Uh, the output that you see in each of these cases, when you look at hover over it, is specific to that node. For example, when you look at leaf 3 if there is a session failure, a BGP session failure, or an OSP of adjacency failure on leaf 3 only then is that count non-zero on leaf 3 for example, if there's a failure between spine 01 and leaf 01, that does not reflect in this particular count. So the information is specific to the node that you see. Besides the information that you see by hovering uh, uh, the mouse over one of the nodes, you can also get additional information about a hop by hovering the mouse over one of the links. In this particular case, you get several pieces of valuable information. For example, you can get, for example, in this particular case, you can get the path type, which is L3. I'm sorry, I was struggling to get the mouse to work. With Firefox, it works, but with Chrome, the mouse uh, vanishes, uh, the hovering information vanishes every time I click on the mouse, uh, the pen. So what you get in here is essentially the path type, which is a routed hop. You get the outgoing interface, the incoming interface, which is basically saying in this particular case that the packet is going out of bond zero interface on server 104 and getting into leaf 04 on bond 02. You get that the MTU information is going between, is going from 1500 to 1500, meaning both the interfaces have the same MTU. You see that it was a default WERF that was used because it's a server, the server has no WERFs. Finally, you also get additional information such as when a routing lookup was done, because the subnet is not the same as the uh, source, because a routing lookup was done, what the route table lookup result was. In this case, 
the IP lookup says that the routing table gave you the, the longest prefix match, hit the entry 172.16.00/16, and the next stop that resulted from it was 172.16.4.1. That information is what is de deciding that you've got to leave 04. If you click on the other side, you get the same information for that specific hop. This information also is specific to each hop. For example, if you point over here, you see that the incoming interface is SWP4. But if you point over here, you see that the incoming interface is SWP3. Thus, you can get additional information about each of the hops to help you make sense of what is going, going on in your path trace. With this information, you might ask, how does this all work if there are errors? But before we go there, um, if you look at this output, one of the things you see here is that you get the outgoing and the incoming interface information by hovering on each of the links. Uh, if you don't want that, if you wish to see the incoming and outgoing interfaces right in the graphical output itself, you can choose this option. And what you get right away is the incoming and the outgoing interfaces in the graphical output itself. If you focus your mouse on one of these nodes, if there is an obscured inf interface such as this one, you can see it. Because the interfaces can get a little obscure and complicated uh, if the graph is more complex, we by default have it turned off. But you can turn it on to make sense of it. And like we pointed out, just hover over one of those links to see what the interface was. The other thing you might want to do is say, hey, I know that a packet is going from source to dest, but what if I also want to just check the reverse path? I know that there are no errors, but is there a problem here? We have a handy button here which just swaps the source and dest, and by clicking on it, you see that the source and the dest get swapped, and you get a new output. This new output is immediately indicating to you that there may be something wrong because this output looks anomalous. It does not look like LIFO 1 and LIFO 2 are going to spine 1 and spine 2. Only one of them is going to spine 1, spine 2. You also get information that something is wrong because of the fact that this link is red in color. We'll investigate what is going on uh, in each of these cases, uh, why the link is red in a different screencast. A blue link here indicates that this is a pure L2 hop as indicated by this line over here. So thus you can make out very quickly what the reverse path looks like, what the forward path looks like, what the different pieces of information are, what routing lookups resulted in, how packet forwarding worked, et cetera, et cetera, just within a single screenshot. Let's now take a look and see what the output would look like if you had a overlay network. For that, let's go ahead and pick an XOS eVPN pick a different set of IP addresses because now the subnets are spread across the racks and then trace and see what happens. What you get from here is a new set of information. The first thing you notice is that there are purple lines. These purple lines are tunneled hops or in other words, they are carrying encapsulated packets. More precisely, this purple line indicates that a packet leaving LIFO2 was VXLAN encapsulated in this case and reached SPINO2 VXLAN encapsulated. If you look at LIFO4, the packet came in VXLAN encapsulated, but it is not potentially going out VXLAN encapsulated. You cannot be sure of that because of the fact that the line here is red, which indicates that there is a problem on that link. If you look at server 01, server 101 sends a packet that is routed it is not VXLAN encapsulated, but as it leaves LIFO2 to go to SPINO1 or SPINO2, the packet is encapsulated. You can get additional information about this encapsulation by hovering over it. And you can see that you get, you get to find out that the routing table that was used for this lookup was populated by BGP, that the routing table lookup resulted in a VTAP lookup, an underlay lookup, and it was the underlay lookup of 10.0.0.134 that resulted in the next stop IP of 10.0.0.22, which gave you, which took you to spine one and spine two. You also see that the VRF has changed. And this change in VRF is a way that Suzy Q automatically determines based on the incoming interface, what the appropriate VRF is. This allows you to trace a path as it passes through multiple VRFs, as in the case of a firewall. 
for example, or through service chaining. The last part of this is we pointed out that there is an error here. And when there is an error, if you click on the link, the last thing, a row at the bottom tells you what the error is. In this particular case, it tells you that the MTO is mismatched and the MTO line tells you that you essentially have packet leaving leaf 04 with an MTO of 9200, but reaching server 304, well, 302 with an MTO of 1500 bytes. So server 302 has an interface of only 1500 MTU, whereas leaf 04 has 9200. So this is clearly an error and it needs to be fixed. Otherwise, you may have packet uh, communication problems. This helps you understand all the different pieces that you can do with Suzy Q. We will use a different screencast to help you to help troubleshoot a specific problem. There is also a help icon here. By clicking on it, you get a help about what is going on to how to make sense of the information that is presented yeah, on this help page, uh, on the Suzy Q trace page. If you summarize what we have just seen, first, Suzy Q's path trace simulates packet forwarding behavior using real state from forwarding tables. Next, it provides a unified overlay plus underlay path tracing. It also provides checks such as path MTU uh, verification. It verifies that there are no errors such as MTU mismatches, loop detection, reverse path failure, etc. You can visually debug hops and nodes. And finally, this has multi-vendor support. This concludes our presentation of Suzy Q's path trace. Please visit Suzy Q's website to be able to go figure out what is uh, uh, test this functionality out yourself. Thank you.